and we're very, very lucky to have Mark Beatty here with us. Mark is a senior multimedia video journalism trainer, which is a great job to have, uh, with the BBC Academy, but he started out creating sound effects for radio drama, which I think is a much more fun job to have, actually. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about creating content, working the story you want to tell, how to tell it, and what equipment you might need. So if I can ask Mark to uh, come forward. Thank you. my own laptop, I'll be in real trouble, won't I? Uh, hello, yes, as Bill explains, I uh, work here in Newcastle, mostly. I'm based here, um, although work with usually BBC journalists from uh, all over the world. They trek to Newcastle from time to time, find out um, how to do things. Before that, I worked mostly for Look North here, working in regional TV news. Um, so uh, apologies if my thoughts tend to be video-based rather than audio based and I know there's a lot of concerns that we think about audio content as well so it's kind of a, a pre-apology in there. Um, I really want to say one main thing and that is that despite the fact that this is all technology driven it really is not about the camera. The kit doesn't matter and I think we're starting to realize that actually it's the story that counts. So what I want to talk about over the next few minutes is a little bit about the thought process about how you go about getting content, whatever we call it, media stuff made. And, and I think, first of all, you've got to tell yourself, uh, ask yourself what you want to make and who you want to make it for, because if you don't know who your audience are, then you're in uh, trouble as we go. If anybody wants to chip in as we go because you think I'm making no sense or you'd like to ask me to expand on something, please do. But we've got some time afterwards, haven't we, Bill, to... Yeah, do, do, do some of that. Okay, I want to show you a little film first, very short, um, and not all of it. Um, this is from uh, a news programme in Gaelic, just to confuse the issue, so if you don't understand the words, you won't be alone. Um, it's potentially a great story. It was made for the BBC's um, Anne La programme, which is made out of Inverness for the Gaelic-speaking community across the UK and beyond. And it's a great tale about um, a farmer who's, they think, the last person ever to do an old farming practice. What they used to do was to take the cows from summer to winter pasture. And the winter pasture was often on small islands because it wasn't quite as cold. And because they didn't have boats big enough, they used to make the cows swim across the sea to the islands. Okay? So, um, here it goes. I'm, I'm going to keep the sound down because, as I said, you won't understand it anyway. <laughs> Actually, anybody here speak Gaelic? No. No. Are you prepared, Job? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what that is? Yeah. 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 You've got to just oh. see the, the a man the and oh look, room. there's a man talking in a room. The BBC's brilliant at interviewing people, talking in rooms. Would you believe I, I, I might be able to, I might be able to get uh, my little pointer on here and slide along because I don't want to watch all of this because you'll get very very dull. It, it actually takes to about one minute thirty eight seconds before we finally, in the distance, <laughs> see a cow. <laughs> Great. Um, so, so I, I, I think what I'm trying to say here is no matter how much you love your story and no matter how passionate you are about it, you've really got to put yourself in the audience's shoes and ask yourself, what do they want to see about your story? What are they going to... Oh! <laughs> But, but the, the sad thing really is that the journalist who made this really did think that people were interested. It's getting fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and the boat does work as well. Brilliant. Now imagine, I'm just going to pause it at that point. Oh, I missed it. Um, if you were to pause your film at that point and say, right, that's the starting point for your film. Okay, never mind the stuff about the motorboat and why the farmer does it and the history of it. That does a whole bunch of things. Immediately, it's impossible to reach for the remote control, right? <laughs> it is absolute, you, you, because it raises so many questions. And part of the art about making a film is getting into your audience's heads and making them subconsciously 
ask themselves questions. And you know what? They won't go away until they've had an answer to that question. And that, what question does that raise? What the hell are they doing? Great. What, what's happening to the cows? Can cows swim? You know, uh, um, do you have to prod them with sharp sticks to make them go in the water? I don't know. But blimey, you're going to keep watching that. So what is your story is, is for me, uh, ab absolutely, absolutely crucial. Um, and, and the whole thing is about not only the big picture story, but also the tiny little story in there as well. The one that, a question that can be asked and answered in five seconds, like a close-up of the cow's head peering above the water. You know, that is, could, that, that's, the, that's the question which can be answered very quickly. No, it's not going to drown. You're fine. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. But why are they doing it? And what's the whole background to this? It's a much bigger picture story, which you can take time. And if you get your audience starting to be engaged in that question, then you've got them for a lot longer. So what is the single most important message for hit me is important? And secondly, why on earth should we really care about it? And this is possibly a tougher one, depending on who you're talking to. And of course, when you're making content, you can have all sorts of people that uh, may be your audience. And they've all got different reasons, either for getting engaged in what you're trying to tell them, or actually um, not really caring in the least. Um, movie making technology has kind of changed. It's not so long ago that this was what you used to have to make any kind of film with. And I guess it's what these cost. 40 grand. It's pretty much spot on. 40,000 pounds for this. Before a camera operator used to have to take a mortgage out and then hope they'd get some work off the back of it. Um, Luckily, things, things have changed, uh, and, and, and we can start to use much cheaper kit. But we might be making different sorts of movies. Um, we've started to think already about <coughs> how you get your intern with the iPhone and what sorts of things they might do. But a record of an event, of a, a stunt or a show or a, a project that your organization's putting on might be one form of media that, that you want to make. You might want to be pitching an idea. I mean. Remember funding? That was nice, wasn't it? Uh, and, but uh, tr trying, to, trying to put together a funding bid or to convince a potential sponsor or partner that a project that you're trying to make is a worthwhile thing for them to get involved in, that might be the sort of media that you want to make. It might be part of a bigger show. You might be putting on some huge theatrical event that you want to back project some great stunning images onto. And, and then you need to start asking a load of questions like, how long is it going to be? And whatever you think of, probably divide it by at least two. Um, and then you need to start thinking about, you know, is this run by a big shot talent presenter? Have you got somebody with a real character who can tell the story? Is it an animation? All these sorts of things. Right. Um, getting on now to the sorts of technology that you can use. This was a film that I worked on. You can probably work out when it was, right? 99? Do we not remember when it was? Angel of the North going up. It was 10 years last year. Yeah, it was, yeah. And, and it was great, but it was made with... It was made with a director, a producer. Every camera operator had a sound recordist with them. It was cut in a cutting room that cost God knows how much. Um, and, and these days, you can do things differently. This is a tiny movie that I shot on an iPhone for my wife who was putting together a, uh, a report for the Beeb about whether iPads were a good idea. Only the BBC could wait for the iPad to be out for a year and then ask themselves whether or not they're a good plan. <laughs> but, but, you know, this was shot. It was, we thought about it a bit, shot it on the iPhone, didn't edit it, top and tailed it, and it's doing a job. It's not a very polished performance, but you can see what's going on. The picture quality is, tonight on a big screen, kind of all right. The phones struggle a bit when it gets to close focus. So the first thing to do, really, is to assess how big your project is, how big your audience is likely to be, um, and how much money you can spend on it. And if you are just going to use your phone or... Like little mini Kodak ZI8 cameras, like flip cameras, uh, 
everyone's got one of those. That's still in production. Sorry? That's still in production. Just, <laughs> yes, just slips aren't any more. Uh, everyone's got one of these hanging around. Most digital stills cameras shoot really quite nice video. Um, and you don't actually need specific kit which is labelled as video kit anymore. You can probably cut it if you need to cut it and you don't make it in one take on the computer you had at home as long as it's less than five years old, probably. And you or your team can make it, potentially, with a bit of help, potentially. Uh, but the cost, of course, is, um, is free, just time. But what does cost is the effort to plan it, think about it, and uh, work out what you want to say. I would talk about, say, the next size of things is kind of what I would call medium, the prosumer thing. This was made for Look North using a camera. John Henry was commissioned to create the sculpture. He's putting the last details into the clay before it's cast in bronze. And it's not quite as good video-wise, although that one these days, frankly, you need to have a really good eye before you can spot the difference between stuff shot on these cameras and the big deal ones that you carry around on your shoulder. Um, medium-sized project, you can shoot on stuff that you can rent. You can rent these cameras for around £50 pounds a day from most you know, production facilities, which is not terribly expensive. You can cut it on a Mac like this one using 100 quid worth of software. £200 pounds now they've updated it into something that nobody likes anymore. <laughs> um, and, and with a bit of help, you or your trade, you, you and your team can can work a camera like that without actually too much uh, input and produce something which is starting to look pretty slick. And the cost is in the hundreds of pounds, um, probably even less than that once you bought uh, your camera. Well, you, I, you probably shouldn't be buying cameras; you'd be renting this kit. Computers are worth having because you can find other uses for them. Cameras can only do one thing. The next scale of things is when actually you do need to spend some real money, and I don't know whether your projects are going to involve this, but they might. This was an extraordinary community project, co-production between the BBC and uh, the local community, a, a musical. And this was shot, as you can see, with lots of lighting, uh, lots of camera rigs, big cameras, sound kit, the whole thing, and is... Um, Fantastic stuff. Um, and if you're going to start making things like that, then you need enough. You probably, do you get the idea? Yeah. You need a large format camera because you, 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 you do need the picture quality. You need people who can operate it and the rigs and the lights. And you may well be cutting it in a big deal edit suite. And the cost for that does start getting expensive. For instance, your average camera crew, depending on whether they think they're cheapskate or have a big reputation up to a thousand pounds a day can be less than that edit well you can see the sorts of costs so it can start to mount up and i would say there's one main caveat here as soon as you start getting into renting people with cameras they're used to working with people who've got strong ideas with directors or reporters um, so make sure you have a pretty clear idea of uh, what you want because you can't when it's somebody else's kit, just nip back and get that shot that you forgot because that's a whole extra day. Um, planning of your shoot is vital. You know, what I, 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 there's all sorts of ways of talking about creativity and how you, how you invent something, but I think when you're trying to plan your movie or your bit of um, audio, you need to kind of sit down in a darkened room and think to yourself about what you'd like it to be. You need to... Imagine it in your head first. Um, what, or what you can't afford to do anymore is go and shoot a whole bunch of stuff and then hope to create it in some kind of edit afterwards. You know, it'll be fine, we'll fix it in post is the phrase that gets used, and it's almost never true. Um, so once you've got your idea, and this will take loads and loads of toing and froing, and how ideas emerge is one of these mysteries of the universe. But once you've got it um, in your head, you then need to think about how you get it onto paper because you can't really communicate these things until they are down on a bit of paper. And the traditional way of getting a bit of video described on paper is to use the old two-column script where the left-hand column describes what you're seeing 
and the right-hand column describes what you're hearing. And the left-hand might be the voiceover of your presenter or uh, reporter. It might be what you think your contributors, guests, interviewees might say. At this stage, you don't know, of course, because you haven't gone out there. But nobody goes to interview somebody unless they've got an idea of what their take might be. So if you're going to interview punters who've been around your struggling South Coast gallery, you can invent some perfect things that they might say. You have a lot of fun with this. This kind of helps because when you start hearing them say it, you think, hey, that's the sort of thing I was hoping they might be saying. Of course, the reality is never quite the same way as you imagine it, which is just as well because our imaginations are pretty limited and the reality of what you find when people do start talking to you is usually a lot more interesting. But unless you've got a, a clear idea in your head about what they might be saying and how you could pull this together, it makes life really tough to go out when you go out there and actually start filming it. Doing things visually can help as well. So um, the idea of a storyboard. Now, nobody thinks they can draw, but you don't really need to be able to draw to do a storyboard. Here's some scribbles which describe somebody walking up to a house in a wide shot. The one up. Second one to the left. Can't do this. Um, long shot of somebody head to toe in the shot, then a close-up of somebody's face, then we see that they're talking to the house. You get the idea? And that way, if things sort of look okay when you cut them together on paper, the chances are they might look okay when you cut them together for real. Um, this isn't a camera class, and I'm not going to try and teach you how to work cameras, but I am going to give you one big tip. Have a look at this. This was shot in the aftermath of a plane crash <coughs> in uh, Nepal. Um, see if you can work out what's going on. Tell me how easy you think this is to watch. This wasn't shot by a professional crew, I hope, or by somebody who's ever picked up a camera before by the looks of it. It's really tough going, isn't it? And it does remind you of your uh, Uncle Alfie's holiday videos when the camera is over here. Oh, look, it's the Grand Canyon, isn't it? Deep down there. There's your Auntie Anne. She's scared she's going to fall in. You know, you're all over the place. Really, my main single tip uh, for anybody who wants to start shooting their own stuff is, bizarrely, don't treat it like a movie camera. Don't move it around. Keep the camera still and let the stuff in front of the frame do the moving for you. You'll find if you do that, that your, your editing is far easier. So get your camera. Work out what's interesting in what you're looking at. Make sure that you can see, the audience can see what you think is interesting. Push the button and hold it for 10 seconds. Just keep it as still as you can. And then turn it off. If something interesting happens in that 10 seconds, by the way, carry on a bit longer, because it might be fun. Um, so that's my main tip. And when you do that, you get stuff that can look like this. This was shot by a guy called Travis Fox, who's a bit of a hero of mine, who's a video One journalist. This is a weird project, but the, the camera never buses moves. You see everywhere. In now, Haiti, they're called tap-taps. They go all over the city, actually all over the country. They're cheap. It's only a few cents to go across town. Since only around 3% of Haitians own their own car, if someone's going more than walking distance, they're going by tap-tap. Tap-taps are privately owned. Each one is there we its go. own. That's me. 